industry. Um, when my grandchildren ask me what money is, what do I tell them? Paul uh, Murphy, member of the Institute. Uh, I have read your book. Um, and I was impressed with uh, your analysis of um, the financial engineering that we've experienced over the last 10 or 12 years and your uh, evaluation of it as uh, producing nothing that was uh, socially useful or very little that was socially useful. Uh, against that background, I was, uh, was intrigued by your um, uh, approach to a financial transaction tax, which on the face of it could uh, deal with this financial engineering problem uh, both by putting sand in the gears of this um, accelerated financial engineering and producing perhaps something socially useful, but I think you have some reservations about it. The second um, point I want to make is, if I understand you correctly, um, your proposal for monetary financing, which is, uh, as you say, breaking a taboo and what have you, is that it should be one-off, uh, maybe I misunderstood, but uh, is it really conceivable that uh, any such mechanism would be used once and once only? And the third point I want to make is a more general one, and it has to do with um, my uh, impression that um, an absolute predicate of your whole approach is that there is a need for growth under all circumstances. Um, and um, perhaps there is a problem about accrediting growth into the indefinite future, a problem about whether it's possible or whether it's desirable. <coughs> Um, I wonder what you think about that. Money is something which gives you a nominal claim on resources because we treat it as money. It is completely circular, right? Uh, if you believe that the money has value and everybody else believes that the money has value, uh, it has value. Um, the more of it you print, the less real value it will have, etc. But it, it is an intriguing circularity in that respect. The other thing to say about money, and the, and the book has quite a lot on this, uh, is, is, is trying to get to the, the key thing of what is money. Uh, a lot of money originally was either money that society simply decided we'll use these, you know, these copper beads or something as our medium exchange. A crucial development then was public money, and the Chinese were the first of this. I mean, uh, when Marco Polo went to China, he was amazed to see that um, the uh, Chinese emperor uh, paid his soldiers with paper money. And, and Marco Polo went back to, you know, the sort of doge in Venice and said, oh, why are we spending all this difficulty trying to get hold of gold, which is a bit expensive? Oh, and we, you know, you can just print the paper money. And the answer is you can, provided you don't print so much of it. So there's some real mysteries about that. And then the other thing to crucially say is most money in modern economies is created by private banks. You know, only, uh, you know, 5% or so of our money in the Eurozone or the UK is the monetary base which exists as a liability of the central bank, either in note, notes and coins forms or in reserves. The other bit has been created by fractional reserve banks, which by a process which uh, a, a, a Mervyn King calls the alchemy uh, 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 is, you know, it becomes money in itself. So um, the, the simple answer is, Money is something that has value because you think it has value. Um, but behind that lay a lot of complexities. I think on Japan, the crucial case, I think essentially a, a, a de facto monetization is occurring. But the problem is that as long as we don't tell the Japanese people that, it doesn't have the stimulative effect that it should. Because if you keep on the Bank of Japan buying this government debt, but you still tell the Japanese people you know, you ought to be very worried about your 250% debt to GDP ratio. And if your Ministry of Finance keeps on producing say, things which say, because of this 250% debt to GDP ratio, we're going to increase the sales tax next year 
and we're going to have a tight fiscal policy that takes us to a fiscal surplus by 2020, then you are offsetting through that rhetoric uh, the potential stimulative effect. You have to, what, what uh, Japan has to do now is loosen the fiscal stance, and it has to tell people we are able to loosen the fiscal stance because a lot of what you thought was debt of government isn't really debt of government at all. That's, that's the essence of that answer. On financial engineering, uh, no, I, I mean, I, I do uh, suggest a support for a financial transactions tax. Um, I don't think it's, um, uh, you know, the answer to everything, but I think there's a good case for it. I think there was a huge explosion of unnecessary financial engineering and trading before the crisis. It's interesting, though, it, it's important to know where that occurred. Um, the one area which really didn't cause problems in 2007 and 2008, for instance, was the foreign exchange market. And it was in the foreign exchange market that James Tobin, in the famous Tobin tax, originally suggested a financial transaction tax. And people still, because they're just sort of you know, creatures of habit, often say, we need a financial transaction tax uh, for the foreign exchange markets. And you say, well, it might be a good way to raise money. But actually, you know, the one thing that didn't go wrong in 2007-8 was excessive volatility uh, in, in foreign exchange. Uh, what went wrong was excessive complexity in the credit intermediation process with the creation of completely unnecessary complex credit securities, CDOs, CDO squared, CBDOs, and huge levels of trading activity. In a sense, you know, we sort of are imposing a financial transactions tax, but people aren't quite noticing it uh, in this fashion. What we have done since the crisis, and this is one of the things that I was involved in as, as a sort of global regulator, we've dramatically increased the equity capital requirements against trading activities. And an equity capital requirement imposed on a bank is a subtle form of a tax imposed on a bank because the returns to equity are not tax deductible whereas the returns to everything, the, the, everything else on the bank balance sheet, all the interest on the bank balance sheet, is tax deductible. So in a sense, when we impose higher capital requirements, we are th on trading activity. We are throwing a bit of grit in the wheels in any case, and I was a strong supporter of that, and I, I think we might want to do even more. Could it ever be one-off? There, there are two arguments about should it be one-off and could it ever. In the book, I say... I would like to believe it's one-off because I think if it's one-off, it's easier to contain the political risk. And I think I could imagine us doing either one-off or for three years, returning to um, a, a reasonable level of inflation and nominal GDP growth, and then, as it were, putting it back in the taboo box for the next 25 years till we faced another similar crisis. The economic argument that makes me not absolutely sure that that is possible is the argument about secular stagnation. What I presented earlier of to why we are where we are was fundamentally the Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff debt overhang explanation of why recovery from 2008 has been so difficult. And that's what my book, sort of 80% of the book argues. But in the book, I also explore a little bit the alternative or additional hypothesis that there might be a, a real secular stagnation uh, effect, the sort of things that Larry Summers is arguing about, a sort of sustained imbalance between how much people want to save and how much investment is occurring. If you really believe that, at the limit, you might have to do monetary finance as the answer year after year after year, which was actually what Milton Friedman suggested in 1948. I'm more worried about how we contain the political risks if you have to use it year after year, because if you use it year after year, that then starts to train the politicians and train the populace that it's available year after year and the dangers of political misuse increase. As for growth, um, there was a section of the book which I took out at my editor's uh, suggestion, because when you're writing a book, you, you, you do have to somewhat focus on one argument and not overcomplicate it, was, which was, does growth matter? Uh, and it drew on arguments from my friend Robert Skidelsky, whose books you, you may know on how much is enough, etc. And I am doubtful as to whether for already rich societies on average, and I would put both the UK and Ireland uh, in there, 
how important further increments in GDP per capita are. I think they certainly become less important. You know, it's incredibly important to get GDP per capita growth in Kenya. I think it's pretty marginal to welfare uh, in Ireland or the UK. However, even if you believe that, we've got a hell of a problem because we have created debts which only make sense on the basis that there will be growth. So one of the real problems for the Japanese debt level is if they had that debt level and they were like China in a position where you could imagine another 20 years of 6% GDP, you could imagine them growing out of it in the way that the UK grew out of 250% public debt at the end of World War II and it had gone down to 50% by 1970. Because when you have a large rate of growth, you can grow out of it. In Japan now, with its demographics and being you know, right at the frontier of technology in a rich society, um, it is very unlikely that the Japanese economy is going to grow by more than half or three-quarter percent per annum. And when you put those figures into the mix, this debt simply can never be repaid. So I do share a bit your feeling we shouldn't fixate on growth, but if that was going to be our point of view, we ought to have developed that point of view 20 years ago, and we shouldn't have created too much debt, because a lot of this debt only makes sense if you believe we're going to have a high rate of growth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. Uh, I'm just going to ask you a uh, question about re redistribution. Is it neutral? The, between, if you compare quantitative easing uh, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and money creation, <coughs> share of that, what you're talking about, what are the redistributive effects? Yep. Okay. Um, Michael Trotty, a retired public servant. Given your pessimistic outlook there for scenario one, uh, I wonder do you think we should uh, jump to scenario three and have a breakup of the euro so that we can all then do our individual monetization? Not being uh, stopped by the Germans. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bottle. Uh, um, I suppose the, when monetary stimulus has been undertaken already in compared to Japan and Europe, it would be most effective when the banking system is fully functioning. Yep. And Japan was quite slow, you know, so the story will be told, in reforming its banking system early, and that was definitely an impediment yep. to the effectiveness. If the Eurozone can tackle the you know, reform and improvement in the banking system, to what extent does that make existing monetary stimulus more effective and perhaps less leading us to the, the terrorism? Um, redistribution. Uh, the, the, the comparison of the, re, the distributive effects of QE versus monetary finance uh, crucially depends on how you do the monetary finance, and there are an infinite set of ways to do the monetary finance, but it's certainly possible, if you wanted, to make the monetary finance much more progressive in its distributive effect than QE. I think it is almost inevitable that QE is somewhat regressive in its, monetary, uh, in its distributive effect because it reduces the interest income on bank deposits whose capital value does not rise when the interest rate goes down. But for people who are the owners of marketable securities, like equities or bonds, uh, although the interest rate goes down, there is a one-off capital gain from the fact that the interest rate goes down. And it is simply an empirical fact that richer people tend to be people who own marketable securities whose uh, uh, value moves in inverse to yield, whereas poorer people tend to hold uh, most of their financial resources in straightforward bank accounts uh, where the interest rate goes down, but they get no capital uplift. So I think there is a reasonable argument that QE uh, is regressive in its uh, uh, distributive effects, and there was a Bank of England study uh, which tended to support that and which I quote in my book. Uh, as for um, monetary finance, it just depends what you do. I mean, you could do a one-off tax cut and you could make it you know, the same percentage for everybody, or you could make it a thousand euros for everybody. And if it was a thousand euros for everybody, that would clearly be a very progressive 
tax cut because it has a much bigger effect uh, for poorer people than richer people. So you just have an infinite variety of how regressive or progressive you can make a monetary finance uh, operation. The Eurozone, huh, that's a very good question. Um, I sometimes do say to German colleagues, look, <laughs> bluntly, if you are going to complete, keep arguing against any fiscal stimulus, whether uh, debt financed or money financed, or keep arguing even against QE or negative interest, if you're going to compete bombarding, what was it uh, uh, Mario Draghi said the other day? He said the, the, the German attitude was null nine, you know, nothing, never, you know, uh, you, you must do nothing. And I think Mario is getting quite frustrated by that. I, I sometimes say, if that's what you really believe, the best thing for the Eurozone would be for you to leave the Eurozone, i.e. for the Germans to leave the Eurozone, and for them uh, then to presumably have a rapidly appreciating currency. With the beautiful irony that if the new Deutschmark began to appreciate against all the other currencies of the remaining Eurozone, I would be willing to bet a large amount of money that in those circumstances, the Bundesbank, as it did throughout the 1960s and 70s, would start intervening in the foreign exchange markets to stop the appreciation, and to do that would buy the government bonds of all the other Eurozone countries. I, it would do outside the Eurozone what it steadfastly tells us we must never do inside uh, the Eurozone. Um, I think it's, you know, I don't know what I would advise Greece. I guess I would say to Greece, stay in. Um, Breakups are very, very difficult. Uh, at the FSA, we were looking very carefully in 2011 and 2012 for, about whether there would be a, a, a Greek exit. And, you know, we were very worried about the knock-on effects because, you know, once one goes, there's an expectation that another goes, then the bond yields start moving, then people start removing money, etc. It's Breaking up is hard to do in, in, in currency zones. It's not straightforward. You have immense complexities about which contracts re-denominate into the new currency. You know, X has lent money to Y, has that re-denominated into the new currency or is that still a eurozone? These things are quite disruptive. So I think the best answer is to try and make it work together. But I don't exclude the possibility that it could get so extreme in its deflationary tendency that it might be better uh, to do a controlled breakup. But I think ideally that would be deemed to two or three blocks rather than to all the way back to you know, whatever it is now, 19 completely separate currencies. Um, I think a fully functioning banking system would make a difference but is not completely transformative. The crucial issue here is the relative weight that you attach to a sort of credit crunch driven by the inability of the banking system to lend money versus a lack of credit demand driven by the fact that real economy borrowers feel that they are over leveraged. And although a lot of people attach a lot of attention to the zombie bank hypothesis, and there's a series of articles on that in on 1990s Japan, the point that Richard Koo makes is, by 1995, there are a whole load of banks willing to lend money to companies at 2%, 1.5%, and they're not borrowing. So that rather pushes one towards, you know, maybe it's more the demand side. And indeed, if you look at uh, I, I quoted in here some of the versions of the ECB monthly bulletin. I remember there's one, I can't remember which particular date it is, which tried to work out whether the slow rate of growth of credit was a demand side hypothesis side or a, a, a supply side. It basically implied that it was more demand rather than supply, though there was an element of supply. And if the fundamental reason why credit growth turns flat to negative after 2008 is as much or more to do with uh, the demand from the real economy borrowers as the supply from the banks, then you know, more rapidly solving the banking system, yes, it would have helped, but it wouldn't have answered everything. It would have been much better if we had been able to do better and more radical stress tests on 
the European banks, not just the Eurozone banks, but the European banks uh, back when we did them in 2010, 2011. And I was part of the Eurosystemic Risk Board and debating that. And the fundamental reason why we couldn't do really strict stress tests, which were fully convincing to the market, was we couldn't answer, what are we going to do if there's an equity hole? Because if you said these Spanish banks, you know, are short equity, and the private market wasn't going to provide them, were you going to ask the Spanish government to be the backstop to that rescue of the banks if it was already so indebted? And this was the, the sovereign <laughs> bank debt loop. And America completely got around that in 2009 by a very straightforward exercise that says we run very tight stress tests on the banks. When we work out whether you failed, you've got six months to raise private money. If at the end of six months you haven't raised private money, the Treasury will recapitalize you. Uh, but you won't like that because you won't be allowed to pay bonuses and your existing equity holders are diluted. We just couldn't do that as straightforwardly as that because we had a whole load of governments whose credit worthiness was also being doubted at the same time as the bank's credit worthiness. And that's why we... So that would have helped quite a bit, but I don't think it would have answered all the problems. A thousand euro in the, in, a, in the post for every adult in the eurozone would come to about 15 weeks of asset purchases by the ECB at the moment. So um, I think it would have something more of an effect. Good. So I think we all had a very enlightening and interesting, interesting talk there. I'm sure we could have gone on. I know there are more questions. Apologies to at least one person who wanted to get one in, but we're a little, little over time already. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you.